So we give a lot of attention to the first words, don't we? If someone has been recently elected to political office and gives an inaugural speech, we tune in to hear the vision for leadership and the years to come. Or maybe you have paid a lot of attention to those first words you want to say to that one person who has caught your eye and you would like to have many more words with. And so you think, I should be funny and lighthearted, or I should be direct and serious. How do I mean to continue? Maybe I should start that way. Or maybe you have attended a first meeting with a supervisor, and you know she's going to want to set the tone for the department going forward. How's it going to be? Is she going to come in and crack some heads? Is he going to spend a lot of time talking about his resume? Does she have a sense of humor? These things tell you a lot about what is to come, the first things that you hear. Or sometimes it's the first meaningful words that um, a young person, a baby, might say. We have uh, stories in our extended family of two very telling encounters. The first is a brother of mine who is now an engineer, works uh, with software and firmware and a lot of things I do not understand that all just happen nicely in my phone because he knows how to make it happen. And as a young person, he was keenly curious about the world around him and wanted to know how things worked, so much so that the very best Christmas present his big sister could give him was to go to Salvation Army and buy all the broken electronics I could find and just give them to him. And this pleased my parents also because it meant that our computer would stay in one piece for at least another month. And so this uh, brother of mine with those particular gifts and skills, the first sort of meaningful non-babble blah 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 dad dad mama was, was that? Was that? Was that? Was that? It was Apparently, unending, I was young enough to not remember it, but this sort of fundamental desire to know what this is, how it all fits together, was absolutely a sign of who God made him to be. How you start sometimes is pretty telling about what is to come. Also, in our more near household, we have a young one who... Um, did, did sort of the normal babbling and high and whatnot, but at nine months, the first clearly enunciated word, cat, with all of the consonants, and that was very telling of the child who you may have seen come to church in various items of cat clothing, who uh, has aspirations for getting out of the house and the, the oppressive rules that say there can only be two cats in the household because... Uh, she will be able to set up a household with many more cats. Uh, how you begin sometimes gives you a, a sense of what is to come. And so Luke here is being very careful when he gives us this first sermon of Jesus, this first sort of piece of public ministry in the Gospel of Luke where Jesus comes to the synagogue, sits down in the role of a teacher, um, which is pretty gutsy, right? He came to the church he grew up in and stepped into the pulpit is effectively what happened. Someone said, would you like to read the lessons? He said, oh yes, and. Right, so there, there's, there's a lot at stake here. Just a few weeks ago, we in church, and just a few chapters ago, Luke's hearers heard, unto you is born this day in the city of David a savior. A savior. And so now is the time where we ask, what kind of a savior were the angels talking about? Are we getting a king? He was born in the city of David after all, and boy, we could sure use an improvement, think the hearers around him. Are we getting a political military strategist? Is he going to sit down and tell us exactly how this revolution is going to go? Because we've been waiting for the one that can figure out how to get Rome off of our backs and save us from this occupation. Or is he going to be one of those preachers and teachers who's going to give us a new perspective and just help us to get through these days? Or maybe a miracle man who's going to fix all our ailments and just wow us. right? The kind of person that you're just watching all the time because you can't wait to see what cool thing they do next. And Jesus does none of that. Jesus says, 
The Spirit of the Lord is on me, anointing me to bring good news to the poor. Release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. How Jesus begins is how he means to continue, isn't it? Right? Again and again, we will see in his life that Jesus is finding us at our points of greatest need. Wholeness for the sick and the suffering. Food for the poor when they are hungry. Restoration to those that do not fit in what's supposed to be acceptable community. Connection where there is disconnection. Freedom where there is bondage, both in terms of literal bondage and an awful lot in terms of the things that tie us up and keep us away from the good that God created us for. The year of the Lord's favor, that is not a small phrase in Scripture. That means jubilee. That means this system that God desires for God's people how well it ever worked out in terms of our ability to live it is a question. But that every so often there would be a reset. So as time goes on and I'm managing my little area of subsistence farming and I get in a little bit of trouble and I have to borrow some money and if I can't pay it back, you get a little slice of my land all next year and I can't pay it back, but you can lend me some money. And slowly but surely, the little slices keep going to the neighbor, keep going to the neighbor, keep going to the neighbor who gets it at a good price, right? Because I'm desperate. And at some point, God says in, in, in the Torah, reset. There needs to be a reset. God's people are not designed to live like this indefinitely. We need to have a reset. And so Jesus is proclaiming the year of the Lord's favor and says, hi, it's here, it's me. And we don't know how well received that was in the moment. I suspect that um, there were people who said, oh, freedom, I have been waiting. If, if you are drowning, you are ready for the year of Jubilee. If you have been so fortunate as to get more than you needed in the order of things and now are going to be asked to return it, oh, that might be harder to hear. And if you come back next week, we will hear a little more about the response that grows out of this. But today, well, actually, today is the word that caught my mind. Today, this is fulfilled in your hearing. It's kind of hard to quite understand since we know that um, all of the things that Jesus was yet to do hadn't happened. This is the beginning. Today, it is fulfilled, though. And we know from 2,000 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus that everything has changed and an awful lot still needs to change. But today, Jesus said, this has been fulfilled in your hearing. And what's interesting is that that phrase, this has been fulfilled. In, in the Greek, it's this tense that means something has happened, and it's really, really, really done, and it's really, really, really still going. So it is, is this sort of perfect, it's accomplished, and it is an ongoing reality. Sort of like at a, a marriage when, when Pastor Tim or I might say, and now I pronounce you husband and wife, something has changed. At the same time, something is going to need to be different every day going forward. And the marriage exists now in a way it didn't used to, but, and it will continue to exist. But not as in a, it happened once and we left it there, but in a, oh, and now we're married today, and now we're married tomorrow, and we're still forgiving the day after that, and we're still negotiating the day after that. It's a relationship that continues. So something that is done and still ongoing. Today, this has been fulfilled in your hearing, Jesus said. And that's the thing. It's Jesus, right? That today is because the presence of Jesus is the accomplishment of what God has promised and the ongoing promise still. So it is the ongoing process of God's freedom cracking our walls, God's mercy mending the things that our violence breaks, God's justice making enough for all. So much so that Jesus could say to the thief on the cross who asked for forgiveness, he said, today you will be with me in paradise, being with me is already the beginning of paradise. To be with Jesus is to be a part 
of this new reality as it is happening, brought into, roped into the freedom and the mercy of God. To be with Jesus is to have the promises of God right there walking alongside of you. The thing is, of course, when we get roped into that reality, it accomplishes something. We are claimed as God's children, and it changes something that goes forward, right? Paul says, now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. You are the body of Christ now. It's good news. We are not alone. God has given you all these people and all. Hundreds more in Valparaiso and thousands and millions more all around the world who are the real honest-to-goodness body of Christ, the presence of Jesus in our world. That's good news because there are days when I need the presence of Jesus and thank goodness there is someone alongside me. And... There are days when someone alongside me needs the presence of Jesus, and thank goodness God has called us together. The first words of God create a reality and describe how it's going to continue. So at that font or the font that you came to in your baptism, somebody said, Suzanne, child of God, you have been sealed by the Holy Spirit, marked with the cross of Christ forever. There's a gift and there's this ongoing reality. So the presence of Christ, wherever it is, is the fulfillment of God's promises. So when a tsunami hits Indonesia, as it did in December, there is the presence of Christ. Specifically in in the story I'm thinking of, it's in our brothers and sisters in the Hurria Christian Batak Protestants, a church that is our partner in the Lutheran um, World Federation. The parts of the body of Christ that were most needed in early January were doctors and nurses and the vehicle drivers to get them there. And so in one week in early January, six or seven of our brothers in Christ in body and in spirit were able to leave their homes, and Indonesia is a very big place, and get to where they needed to be that was otherwise completely cut off and provide medical care for 800 tsunami victims who had no other recourse. And they were able to do that because of the gifts and the anointing that God gave them as God called them into the body of Christ. And we got to share in that as partners in ministry and in and, and had the opportunity to share some of our ELCA disaster response funding to help get them there. So the body of Christ is present there in that moment. Here in Valparaiso, the body of Christ is present when I go with my children or volunteer in the schools and I see Christ in the care and commitment of Lutheran lunch aides and social workers, Catholic teachers and bus drivers, Baptist Baptist basketball coaches. I shouldn't have put those words together. And Pentecostal school nurses. The Spirit of the Lord is on them to bring good news to the young people in their care. I see it at work. In your life, you might have stories of the body of Christ present, bringing freedom and hope for you. Maybe it was at Porter Hospital where, surprise, the nurse or the person from the cath lab or your doctor or some other medical place turned out to be a familiar face. And you could say, hey, I have seen you at my church. Or an unfamiliar person whose faith is evident say, I am holding you in my prayers. Good news that you are not alone. Or maybe it's the person just happened to be in the pew in front of you that first week that you showed up in a new community to say, ah, welcome, I know you. Remember me? We were blah, 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 blah. That opportunity for connection. Or maybe in the police officer who responds to your emergency, or maybe in the coworker who's promised to pray for you is one of those promises that you can actually trust and believe and know what a gift it is that that person holds you. Where Jesus is, where the body of Christ is, the promises of God are out in the world actively being fulfilled. You are the body of Christ. And wherever the body of Christ is, is good news. 
Thanks be to God.